So here's just an example of a lovely woman um, with advanced pancreatic cancer with hepatic metastases who came to uh, me in 2004 in February. She was given three months to live at the time. Um, in uh, March of uh, 2004, um, she uh, came to our office, we put her on a comprehensive integrative program, we individualized it, we ran a variety of laboratory tests on her, we chronomodulated her chemotherapy, we gave her an aggressive, personalized, uh, both by her staging, her disease, um, all the information that we could find out about her disease, as well as uh, some of the early um, terrain and molecular testing um, that we did with her. We were able to really refine a program. Um, she was in a near remission um, that eventually ended up in uh, putting her on a recurrence prevention program and then a survivorship program um, as well. And she went on to live actually um, just to a few months ago. She died in uh, 2021, uh, very sadly, um, totally unrelated uh, from really vascular uh, and cardiac uh, problems, uh, nothing to do with her original cancer, which I'll show you. So, she had a rather large pancreatic mass, to say the least, um, at the time that she was uh, diagnosed with us. She had multiple hepatic metastases as well. By 2009, both the mass improved. Let me see if I can go back for a second. Uh, doesn't want to go back. Oh, there. You can see how this had shrunk down and was no longer active uh, on a PET scan. So we believe most of that was scar tissue, if not all of it. And you can see how clean her liver was five years later, five and a half years later under care. And this is her in our office uh, with me in uh, 2000, uh, February of uh, you know 2021, um, actually January, she was in the uh, office here. Um, this is a gentleman that came to me uh, many years ago. He was diagnosed initially with a right flanked uh, malignant melanoma um, in September of 2000, uh, I'm sorry, of 1988. Um, was under my care since January of 1990. He had developed metastatic uh, lesions with uh, axillary uh, nodal uh, involvement, and we put him on a full comprehensive integrative program as well. Um, he initially refused any further uh, therapy postoperatively, um, and in those years, uh, it wasn't totally unreasonable because the treatments weren't that effective. Um, he improved and cleared up and is alive and well today. Um, if you uh, take it back from, you know, 1990, you know, uh, 1988, um, you know, he, he's out at this time uh, somewhere around, uh, I believe that's 23 years. Uh, so really quite impressive. This is a great story. This is a guy that um, actually uh, uh, a patient of mine drove all the way to visit him and his daughter, who was his nurse when he first was diagnosed um, with kidney cancer. Um, he was in a hospital uh, in Colorado, and uh, this patient of mine had the same uh, disease, was seven years out uh, with metastatic kidney cancer under our care. And when his daughter called him, he said, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. I'm going to jump in a car and come visit. And he spent the entire weekend with her and with this patient who had just been hospitalized. The patient had kidney with lung and lymph metastases and was given a year to live for the next year and a half, he came to see us monthly. You can see what he looked like. He was a cattle farmer. And um, this is uh, him uh, about 15 years later. He is still alive and well today. Um, he's now out 31 years. And he changed his entire cattle farm to an organic vegetable farm. So I say he traded cattle for carrots. Really quite a wonderful story. So I'm gonna go e through each of these spheres and give you some science and some background for it. I'm gonna start off with the first sphere, what I call the biographical environment, nutrition, fitness, biobehavioral strategies, 
and sleep hygiene. And just to point out that we have an entire staff that works with patients in each of these different areas, and we do um, fairly intensive training and education for patients. We do assessments. This is only a fingerprint, a snapshot of that. Um, nutritionally, uh, we look at different laboratory analyses and body composition analysis. We look in terms of fitness and checking patients uh, in terms of rest activity cycles, uh, muscle mass, uh, endurance, uh, and other uh, parameters. Uh, we do biobehavioral screening and using validated uh, instruments uh, to analyze where patients are at in order to develop programs to tailor to them uh, and uh, also address areas of uh, attitude and uh, kind of where they're at. Nutritionally, this is the, the hallmark of our uh, culture. Uh, Western diet. Uh, uh, this is now some years ago, but the average American at the time was consuming 90 pounds of fat a year, uh, 23 gallons of ice cream, uh, 134 pounds of refined sugar, 365 uh, soda pops, uh, 356 uh, donuts. Uh, and because I don't eat any, and I certainly know that my wife Penny doesn't eat any, that means there's somebody out there eating 712 uh, donuts a year, you know, a day, I'm sorry. This is, uh, you know, ac across a year and not a day. I got that off. Um, but you can kind of get an idea of just, you know, where we're at with this. So this is uh, research that, um, you know, was around uh, really and, and published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition back in the early 2000s. Um, it still hasn't been taken to heart in the way that it, it should be. Uh, this is typical Western diet. Um, and I could point at almost any solid a tumor to be comparable to what the cardiac world would have looked at. So red meat, processed meat, butter, potatoes, refined grains, um, high fat dairy. And you can see these patients had an increase in cardiac risk of 46%. And if you went to what was then called a prudent diet, vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, um, uh, fish and seafood possibly, uh, or a vegan diet, you get um, a 24% reduction in cardiac risk. So instead of a 46% elevation, you could actually drop. Well, this is almost comparable to breast cancer in terms of what we know, uh, you know, in terms of actual data. Um, some of this is based on, you know, foods. I, I mentioned carbs and refined carbs. Uh, a carb is not a carb is not a carb. Uh, we know that whole cereal grains are really, uh, you know, major and important substances. And in spite of the fact that there's a lot of claims that these will drive up glycemia, uh, most of the solid research says the opposite, that this helps stabilize. On the other hand, refined flour and sugars, uh, uh, without a doubt, can drive up glycemia. And we measure and test patients uh, you know, continually in this regard, and that can drive up uh, insulin, which is one of the main, uh, main growth factors uh, in the body. So it's very important in this regards. Now, I don't want to get into a long debate about you know, gluten and uh, what I, I really think, but I will tell you that you can take patients who have um, gluten enteropathies um, or think they do and have not shown it on testing, but are very leery. And you send them to a country, uh, possibly like Italy, where um, uh, things like glyphosates are outlawed and uh, you encourage them to eat pasta for several days and they'll all come back to my office and say, how come I didn't get sick when I was eating it in Italy? It was, cause, was it because I was on vacation? I said, no, it's because of where you were on vacation. So I really believe there is gluten enteropathy. I'm not questioning that. But I think there is a majority of people who think they're having problems with gluten that are, in fact, having problems with the way that we grow wheat and some of the chemicals and compounds that speed up the growth rate and increase uh, glycemia and uh, glycemic effects. Uh, in this regard. In terms of fats, there really are good fats and probably one could say not so good fats. 
um, we know that uh, um, there is a ratio in the membranes, the bilayered membranes of all of our cells, and they're filled with the fats that you ate the last 90 days. And if you ate um, unhealthy fats, if your ratios of saturates and omega-6s are high, your ratio can be anywhere from 20 to 1 bad fats to good fats, and even much higher as we've tested in patients and been able to demonstrate, whereas we're really looking for at least a one to one, two to one, maybe even four to one ratio, which would get you to be far less pro-inflammatory, which is clearly associated with cancer and resistance and side effects uh, and even interference of treatment uh, in this regard. Um, so a healthy diet, um, and this is uh, work done by the Healthy Eating Index uh, and uh, through the National Cancer Database, and we know that uh, if you um, have an overall healthy diet, it can drastically reduce cancer mortality, and the, that research showed as much as a 65% reduction in cancer mortality. Whereas reducing saturated fats to less than 10% accounted for a 45% drop in cancer mortality alone. So I do raise some concerns and questions about keto diets and paleo diets for cancer patients. Um, while there may be some data of increasing oxidative stress by increasing fats during the treatment cycle, there's equal research going on suggesting much cleaner diets and very limited caloric intake to reduce toxicity. But a lot of this is still in the experimental phase. There may be some cancers, very rare cancers, like primary brain cancers, where starving the brain from glucose may actually have some therapeutic benefit. But outside of that, the vast majority of cancers, uh, mortality will go up, as will mutagenesis, a mutation. Um, for, from consuming the higher amounts of saturated fats, uh, mostly from animal proteins. And if you shift the kind of fat, this is a uh, study with 3,000 patients with early stage breast cancer over a seven and a half year period. And they did seven, uh, um, they performed uh, dietary intake assessments seven times uh, during the seven plus year uh, study period on these patients. And we know that a diet high in marine fish oils decreased breast cancer and recurrence and metastases by 28%. And it decreased breast cancer mortality by 41%. Intriguingly, there was not evidence of using a high EPA DHA um, you know, uh, um, analysis um, for patients in terms of what they consumed, um, whether it be dietary or supplemental, um, that this did not reduce cancer risk. Um, however, as I suggested, it was impressive data and it did counter recurrence, metastases, and mortality. So, you know, what fat track are you on? Uh, you know, what's your terrain? And it's influenced by how you eat and how you take care of yourself. And, uh, you know, is it cancer, uh, cardiac, diabetes, aging? You know, uh, that's a health risk uh, from this. And what we know today is, is that, and I'll be simplistic a little bit, that these are kind of like two fat tracks. And when you consume certain foods, certain vegetable oils like corn oil and safflower oil um, and sunflower oil, and you consume a high amount of the fats from uh, red meats and poultry and milk products, you increase and drive up arachidonic acid, and that drives up prostaglandin E2 and leukotriene B4, and that will drive immunosuppression, tumor growth, clot promotion, um, thus risks of pulmonary emboli and thrombi, uh, inflammation, angiogenesis, the biology that's necessary for a cancer to grow. These enzymes function a little like batteries and whatever you're fueling your diet with, they will engage and drive that pathway. 
if we switch to better fats, flax, walnut, uh, pumpkin seed oil, uh, high quality canola oil, cold water fish, we actually drive up eicosapentaenoic acid and PGE3, and we create a terrain, a biology that is more cancer fighting, immune enhanced, uh, inhibiting tumor growth, inhibiting clots, countering inflammation and vascular supply angiogenesis uh, in this regard. Um, uh, losing my, okay. I often get the question, you know, but where's the data doc? So this is just a snapshot of what my research team and I put together. These are all randomized controlled trials, mostly looking at low fat diets, as well as healthy diets and getting rid of excess of uh, body fat um, through fitness and through nutrition regimens like ours. And you can see through outcomes, these numbers are actually quite significant. Um, you can see, you know, drops of uh, 40, 50, 60% in terms of factors like recurrence, cancer mortality, and all cause mortality. In fact, in these studies here, in all cases, the cancer related events occurred less frequently in the experimental diet group than in the control group. And these are gold standard randomized controlled uh, trials. Uh, you know, so this is a, a big deal. This is not you know, a small one. This was a study done by a really amazing uh, researcher, uh, um, uh, Dr. Klebowski out of Harvard and his team. He's done a lot of these kinds of analyses. This was first presented um, at the American Society for Clinical Oncology, I sat in on that meeting. Uh, thousands of uh, clinicians, uh, oncologists, and researchers uh, from around the globe um, listened to this presentation. And there were over 2,400 patients with breast cancer. And I just want to point out that they, they were put on an intervention of 20% uh, fat diet. And the entire intervention group showed approximately a 24% reduction in risk of recurrence. Well, this is comparable to tamoxifen. It has the same impact of what tamoxifen had in terms of redu reducing recurrence rates. And yet my bet is that this is the, 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 the my bet is that less than three to five percent of US cancer specialists ever discuss diet with their patients. And yet you can see how profound this research is. I actually refer to this as the valley of death, the lag between the bench and the clinic. Um, it's a major chasm of what we know versus what we actually promote and put into clinical practice. Uh, and it is uh, an unfortunate chasm that needs to be fixed so the patients don't uh, unfortunately decline when there are treatments around that could make a big difference for them, regardless of what camp those treatments came from. This is a study, a diet rich in fish cuts prostate cancer mortality. So very similar to the breast cancer one, this was um, uh, fish and the effect of EPA and DHA data found also no link between fish intake and the risk of developing prostate cancer. However, in this 31 study analysis, there was 40, a 44% reduction in developing metastatic prostate cancer. And prostate cancer mortality was lowered by 63%. So I asked my research team at one point to put together um, a bunch of different studies and so that we could actually look at what is it that increases colorectal cancer and what is it that decreases colon cancer. And um, this is the data. I'm not going to you know, spend a lot of time going through all of the pieces of information. I promise you I could talk for a half hour about this to the, the next few slides alone. But um, what we you know, were able to demonstrate uh, from existing research is that sugar-sweetened beverages increase colorectal cancer recurrence, 
Um, and you can see that um, right here. Um, you know, and this is about one and three quarter, almost uh, twofold uh, increase. That a Western diet, if you come down here, um, had a near two and a half fold risk of increasing all cause mortality and a near three fold risk of increasing recurrence risk. And that red meat alone accounted for 78% of that increased risk. And yet, as I suggested for breast cancer, I don't hear patients of mine suggesting at all that any of the cancer specialists that they had seen previously brought up anything in the regards to nutrition and diet, unless they had visited integrative naturopathic um, alternative leaning uh, physicians. And this is shameful because this is hard data that we're talking about that should be core to medical practice and to oncology practice and fundamental. This is decreasing. Uh, the, this, these were cohorts based on dietary surveys of stage one through three patients, just like the other slide, um, and after a colorectal cancer diagnosis. And what we know from, if you look at the nuts here, um, uh, I don't mean the people, I mean the <laughs> consumption of food, uh, there is a near 60% reduction in colon, colorectal cancer recurrence, a greater than 30% reduction in colorectal cancer mortality. Fiber showed a near 30% reduction in mortality and fish a greater than 30% drop in uh, colorectal cancer recurrence. Important studies, and this is our general program, not individualized in a presentation like this, but just to give you the food categories that we're encouraging our patients to eat, a rainbow of vegetables, whole cereal grains, uh, mostly plant-based proteins, uh, legumes, uh, seeds, nuts, um, if they choose to fish, um, uh, eggs, uh, preferably omega-3 um, and or egg whites, um, and uh, not too much in the way of uh, yolks because of saturated fat concerns. Um, fruits, melons, berries, but really leaning to lower glycemic fruits, um, depending on where patients' uh, laboratory testing and terrain testing tell us their glycemic and hyperinsulinemic issues are and how concerning are we will uh, affect their diets, limiting fat intake and choosing um, really high quality sources from deep sea fish or uh, better nuts and seeds and avocados, um, substituting dairy alternatives um, for a number of plant-based milk products and uh, cheese products today and even uh, um, uh, plant-based ice creams. Um, and then uh, supplementing with uh, whole food uh, based uh, green drinks, uh, which we really encourage for our patients. And this is just some pictures of our clinic and some of the teaching and stuff going on. Um, we have whole kitchens in our operation, um, unfortunately uh, kind of shut down during the period of COVID.